So uh, what I'm presenting today is a portion of ongoing research on Ficino's cosmology. Um, I stumbled onto Ficino's cosmology uh, or stumbled working onto Ficino's cosmology um, a couple of years ago, and I'll be presenting a portion of an article uh, that should be coming out, but I'm now um, well into working on the second part of this research. So I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to take any uh, suggestions um, on the material I'm presenting. Now I'm interested in um, uh, the, you can say the, the metaphysical assumptions and metaphysical implications to Renaissance cosmologies. So uh, this paper is a paper on cosmology and I think appropriately enough for uh, the emphasis seminars uh, on the scientific imagination, uh, but it is also on uh, the metaphysics behind certain uh, cosmologies and Ficino's in particular, uh, dealing with uh, his magnum opus, the Platonic Theology, uh, which he, well, one of his magnum, uh, which he wrote in between 1469 and 74. Uh, so I've presented about, I've prepared about 45 minutes worth of material if I don't digress too much, and then I'll be happy to take questions afterwards. So I'll just begin. So Marsilio Ficino legislates his world, his platonic theology, the soul, and his notion of a divinus nodus with mean terms. The first four books, of his Platonic theology have a well-defined order marking the metaphysical and cosmological boundaries like a mappa mundi for the remaining 14 books. The philosophical hierarchy in these four books, moreover, mirrors their compositional form. Platonic theology 1.1 establishes the work's goal, which late ancient Platonists following Iamblichus would have called the, world, the, the work's scopos. That is the soul's happiness and proper end is to assimilate to God, according to Ficino. The first book of the Platonic theology also establishes the works order, which these same ancient Platonists would have called a works series or structure, the taxis. Platonic theology 1.1, therefore, has a protreptic function. It enters, enters in the coordinates for its reader's destination and lays down a philosophical roadmap to help them reach it. Ficino marks how far ancient philosophers were able to go before ending their voyage. The followers of Democritus, the Syrianics, and the Epicureans quickly found themselves at an impasse. Like travelers unable to continue their journey because a weighty boulder blocks their path, these ancient materialists were unable to go past or even see beyond corporeal considerations. Stoics and Cynics fared slightly better, since at least their imminent metaphysics and naturalist cosmologies forced them to consider bodies as more than mass and matter, but also as power and quality. But their journey too ended early. A few ancient theologians, Heraclitus, Marcus Vero, and Manilius, made it farther and rested at a third spot, the seat of the rational soul. Here they discovered that a form exists which surpasses quality. From this vantage point, two Greek philosophers traveling from Klatzomenas are farther ahead and found a fourth resting place, the intellect, or as Ficino also says, the angelic mind. The first, Hermotimus, was sometimes grouped with, Pyth with Pythagoreans, especially since Diogenes Laertius reports that he was one of Pythagoras's prior lives. The second, Anaxagoras, was a rational cosmologist who taught Athenians that the cosmos is an orderly mixture of elements. And both philosophers are credited for arguing that nous or intellect governs the cosmos. Ficino rounds out his series with a fifth example, Plato, who I quote, urges, instructs, and enjoys us to gaze, uh, to direct the gaze of the mind once it has been purified towards the light of truth. Ficino concludes the first chapter of his Platonic theology by telling his readers that they should begin their ascent only with experienced platonic guides, since only they know the upward path. I quote, once we have ascended so far, we shall compare in turn these five levels of being, body or bodily mass, quality, soul, angel, and God, because the genus of the rational soul, which occupies the midpoint of these five levels, appears to be the link that holds all nature together, right? The vinculum to, uh, natura totius. It controls qualities and bodies while it joins itself with angel and with God. I shall demonstrate first 
that it is in fact completely indissoluble because it holds together the different levels of nature. Next, that it is preeminent because it presides over the framework of the world. And finally, that it is most blessed when it steals into the bosom of the divine. And I should say I'm quoting from Michael Allen's translation. Ficino thus establishes at the outset of the Platonic theology that the rational soul could ascend to the highest goal and that it is the mean term binding the parts of the cosmos together and the whole cosmos to the intelligible reality beyond it. In, Platonic the in the third book of the Platonic theology, uh, Ficino puts forward an analogous structure to the one we find in the first book. Having analyzed each of the five grades of reality in ascending order in between these sections, at the beginning of the third book of the Platonic Theology, Ficino surveys the whole fivefold series in a descending order, as he did beginning with the first book in an ascending order, but this time according to what he calls the Pythagorean principles of the one and the many. I quote, um, the Pythagoreans describe body as, uh, the Pythagoreans describe body as the many, quality as the many and the one, soul as the one and the many, angel as the one many, and God as the one. Uh, the one's unity uh, holds all the parts of the many together. Uh, and Ficino says, uh, this is what provides the divine bond or the divinus nodus. I think I skipped ahead a little. Um, uh, he says, this is what provides the divine bond, the divinus nodus, whereby God in Timaeus's view always preserves things that are in themselves dissoluble from dissolution. So the third book of the Platonic theology thus reverses the order of the first book while refining its claim. The rational soul is the vinculum naturae insofar as it is the mean term in the series, but it specifically unifies the series insofar as it itself unified by the highest term, the one. Thus the angelic mind too, according to Ficino, is a mean term between uh, God and soul, and uh, as is quality between soul and body. That the one brings unity to all the beings in all grades of reality is itself the nodus divinus, according to Ficino. So in that passage that I just read, Ficino openly invokes the demiurge's speech to the gods in Plato's Timaeus um, as a source for his notion of the nodus divinus. In that work, uh, the character Timaeus recites that after the demiurge had made celestial beings, uh, younger gods who shall be immortal and forever linked to the demiurge's indissoluble bond, he proclaimed to them that it is also necessary to make terrestrial uh, beings themselves. And that's the passage that I won't read for you. Um, the demiurge subsequently commands the gods to fabricate these living beings by mixing mortal ingredient, a mortal ingredient with an immortal part, which the demiurge calls theos or divine the part that they share with the gods, that is. Ficino appeals to this Timaean myth for his own notion of a divinus nodus, interpreting this divine part as a principle of unification, the aforementioned bond, the desmos, uh, which is thus a divine bond, a theos desmos in Greek or a divinus nodus in Latin. Ficino tests the strength of this divine bond with other passages in the Timaeus concerning mathematical explanations of the world soul, the cosmos, and the elements. In fact, Plato first employs mean terms in the Timaeus as a mathematical function. To explain how the cosmos became corporeal, in Plato's words, visible and tangible, Timaeus conveys that the demiurge first employed a mixture of the element fire, the principle of visibility, and the element earth, the principle of tangibility, to make the cosmic body. Plato explains the mixture's unity as a mathematical function, and here I will read the, the quotation. But it is not possible that two things alone should be conjoined without a third, for there must needs be some intermediary bond to connect the two. The fairest bond is that which most perfectly unites into one both itself and the things which it binds together. And to effect this in the fairest manner is the natural property of proportion. For whenever the middle term of any three numbers, cubic or square, is such that as the first term is to it, so is it to the last term. And again, conversely, as the last term is to the middle, so is the middle to the first, then the middle term becomes in turn the first and the last, while the first and last become in turn middle terms. 
And the necessary consequence will be that all the terms are interchangeable and being interchangeable, they all form a unity. So the mean terms in this passage take the form of ratios in mathematical proportions, as you see here on screen. Um, you can function algebraically or numerically. The whole series unfolds interchangeably according to the same ratios. In this case, the perfect or double ratio of geometric means in order to maintain the unity of the series. It's divine or beautiful bond, um, as uh, Ficino would have it. Ficino has other important sources, not just Plato, to understand the system of ratios. Pseudotimaeus Locris's De Natura Mundi, for example, offers a gloss on this passage from the Timaeus. When the ratios between three terms are identical, even when we invert and change the order of the terms, this kind of bond is a just measure, according to the source. Ficino also studies this gloss in Iamblichus's large Pythagorean work, the De Secta Pythagorica, where Iamblichus, right, the late third, early fourth century Syrian philosopher, quotes this passage from the pseudo Timaeus Locris immediately after the relevant passage from Plato's Timaeus. So Iamblichus then reports that the testimony, uh, reports testimony that Plato plagiarized this pseudo Timaeus Locris, which is an opinion that feeds Ficino's conviction that uh, the Timaeus is one of Plato's Pythagorean works. Um, and it, the gloss that we find in, uh, in Iamblichus turns this a pseudepigraphon into actually something like a Pythagorean source for Ficino explaining the mathematical structure of the cosmos. Plato goes on to explain that to demonstrate the proportions in any two-dimensional plane surface, only three terms suffice, a first and last term, as well as a single mean term, as in the examples above. However, a fourth term is needed uh, to demonstrate the proportions of solids. So two mean terms are needed to account for the figure's depth as in the series A is to B, as B is to C, as C is to D, and so on. Now, since the body of the cosmos is a solid figure made out of four elements, fire, air, water, and earth in that order, its bonds take on the form of the ratios as we have them here, with uh, air and water being the mean terms. Plato afterwards deploys uh, mean terms again in a system of double and triple proportions to measure the orbits of the seven planets around the earth. And he inserts arithmetic and harmonic mean terms between them to unfold intervals of uh, what he calls the world soul's mathematical structure. But my point here isn't to analyze the mathematical constitution of the cosmos or the world soul in the Timaeus as a whole, nor to do so in any particular detail, but to emphasize some salient features in Plato's use of mean terms that became a part of Ficino's mental toolkit. These principles of Platonic mathematics hold uh, the scaffolding of Ficino's cosmology and metaphysics together. Take one obvious example, Ficino's reconstruction through mean terms of Plato's elemental theory while commenting on the Timaeus. Each element is understood as a platonic solid composed with three qualities corresponding to its three dimensions. Ficino explains that their shared qualities interlock the elements according to uh, a neoplatonic triad of essence, power, and act. Ficino's reconstruction follows the theorem that only one mean proportional number is required for two square numbers, but two mean proportional numbers are required for two cube numbers, or in this case, two three-dimensional solids. That Proclus, the uh, fifth century philosopher from Athens, and his followers also mathematized the elements in, in similar ways, serve as a, it serves as a reminder that Ficino is not the sole explorer of mathematical theologies and cosmologies, but is part of an older uh, ancient tradition. In fact, it would be an exaggeration to claim that this tradition originates with Iamblichus, who would have encountered similar approaches uh, by earlier Platonists and Neo-Pythagoreans. But Iamblichus is perhaps the first thinker to make the mathematization of mean terms an essential component of his philosophy. Now, E.R. Dodds famously labels this Iamblichian development the law of mean terms, and he defines it as I have it on the screen. Two doubly disjunct terms, A, B, and not A, not B, cannot be continuous, but must be linked by an intermediate term, either A, not B, or B, not A, which forms a triad. Now, to clarify this law, 
um, or how it's employed by philosophers and, um, and thinkers in the pre-modern world, um, especially since the Timaeus is a key source for many of them, including Amblichus and Ficino, I would first formulate this law as I've redefined it on the screen um, as a function of uh, geometric proportion. Now, I won't go through this in detail. I'm happy to go in, in the question, but I'll leave it there for now. Um, applying this law can simply express um, the similar proportion between two dissimilar terms in a series by positing a third disjunctive term whose properties are partially shared with the other two. One might find applications in natural philosophy, as in Ficino's explanation of elemental qualities, or in metaphysics. For example, the terms introduced by the demiurge in Plato's Timaeus in his command to the gods to make mortals. Um, he'll say between two terms, let's say P and Q, where P has divine and immortal properties and Q has non-divine and mortal properties, one needs to posit a third term, uh, either R1 with divine mortal properties or R2 with non-divine and immortal properties. The relationship of these terms could be expressed as I have it up on the screen. And one could also apply the relationship for other series, uh, inputting different values into the algebraic formula. It would be left up to the metaphysician to determine whether R1 or R2 have properties that can cohere with the principles the series expresses without contradicting them. It's clear, however, from this example, that most um, metaphysical and cosmological applications of the law of mean terms structures the series hierarchically. And this is typically how we observe it in Iamblichus and later Platonists, as well as Aristotelians and a number of other philosophers and theologians. That is, they employ this law neither simply as a function of proportional ratios, nor as a logical equation for syllogistics, but as a formulation of dialectical modalities unfolding the inner logic of a metaphysical procession from a higher first principle to its contrary without establishing a contradiction. And I think for that reason, I'd actually uh, formulate it in the second way I have it on the screen. This one powerful formula contains a multiplicity of cosmoi, a plurality of heavens, a concentration of analogies of beings, a plenitude of divinities and powers. With it, as though it were a magical formula, a metaphysician can create worlds, trinities, divine processions of pagan gods, or Christian angelic hierarchies. Of course, Iamblichus would not have taken credit for the formulation of this law, since one could discover it in his predecessors. In fact, no one should get credit for inventing the law, nor for creating worlds or realities with it, according to Iamblichus, since it's simply the mathematical pattern woven into reality. He would resist the notion that it is a logical instrument separate from philosophy, preferring to think of it as an expression of philosophy's capstone or bond dialectic. Under it, the law of mean terms connects all the terms in a mathesis universalis. It is also with this Lydian touchstone that Iamblichus identifies a theoretical series and cor corrects Porphyry at the beginning of one of his most famous works, the De Mysteris, that Ficino translates. And I'm not going to read this, but there it is. Iamblichus reproaches Porphyry for trying to establish a theological taxonomy, dividing the divine into a genus of, and species um, according to differentiae. The correct way to do theology, according to Iamblichus, is by mean terms and similar unities. The one connects to lower median, mediating terms by means of unifying similitudes, ratios, as it were, shared by different terms. This early section of the De Mysteris, which Ficino studies and translates, echoes the Timaeus on the divine mathematical bond. And Iamblichus bequeathed this way of doing philosophy, a form of formalizing Platonic mediation and causality into hierarchies to later philosophers, Platonists like Syrianus and Proclus, and uh, others who handed it down to Pseudo-Dionysus the Areopagus. Um, uh, who Christianized it perhaps more than anyone else, and to a legion of medieval theologians inspired by Dionysian angelic hierarchies like Gilbertus Magnus, uh, Thomas Aquinas, Bonaventure, and Cusanus, for whom it was uh, known through different applications, such as the Lex Divinitatis or the Coincidence of Opposites. 
Jamblichian mean terms are a source of creative tension in Ficino's thinking. He employs the law safely at low wattage to explain elemental qualities, as I showed before. But he also risks exploding the cosmos, kind of chain reaction of mean terms with Jamblichian metaphysics in his platonic theology by employing the law at maximum power to multiply and populate the world with souls and divinities. This will become clear after analyzing Ficino's ordering of the platonic theology. Ficino commits to the structural itinerary of the first book of the Platonic Theology for the work's goal and order in the subsequent, cha subsequent chapters of book one, explaining the nature of each metaphysical term in an ordered series. First explaining body and quality while responding to the aforementioned philosophers who follow Democritus, the Syrianics and the Epicureans in a Platonic Theology 1.2. This is the only way I could uh, uh, fit the schema of the Platonic Theology book one through four in one image, but you can follow along the various books um, uh, as it, it, it progresses. So um, after uh, discussing uh, body and quality in 1.2, he then moves on to quality and soul while responding to the Stoics and Cynics in 1.3 followed by the rational soul in 1.4, then the soul and the angelic mind or intellect while responding to Heraclitus, Vero, and Manilius in 1.5, and finally to the angelic intellect and God in 1.6. It's important to note how each of Ficino's five explanatory chapters in the first book is not devoted to just a single term in the series. Each chapter discusses two terms to ensure that each chapter, like each metaphysical term, is connected to the next through mean terms, ascending hierarchically, proceeding from body and quality to quality and soul, and from soul and intellect to intellect and God. And it's only the rational soul, um, 1.4, uh, that has, that's the mean term at the center of the hierarchy that has its own chapter. So having begun a discussion of God, the highest metaphysical term in the series, in the last chapter of the book, that's 1.6, Ficino devotes the whole second book to God. Following the logic of his order, Ficino begins book two by explaining how the highest term in the series is a triadic unity of unity, truth, goodness itself, that's 2.1, um, uh, which is above all plurality, which is in 2.2, 2.3. Ficino thereafter continues his, his argument um, until uh, book two, chapter 12, with an examination of God's divine attributes, his names and activities, which one might conceive as a kind of horizontal or proportional convertibility of the highest terms to talk about God. And he ends book two appropriately enough um, after discussing God's intellect and will on the topic of God's downward inclining power, that is his love and providence, in uh, 2.13. He then descends down the five grades. So you can see how the, the structure of the compositional order has both an ascent and a descent. Um, book three has two chapters. The first descends the whole hierarchical series by way of the Pythagorean comparison of each term in the sequence. The second explains how soul is the middle term linking the metaphysical and cosmological series as a whole. Now, the first chapter of the fourth book continues where the previous chapter ends by discussing the nature of the rational soul as the mean term connecting the complete hierarchical series. Ficino further unfolds the series um, at the, in the first chapter of book four, according to a principle of mean terms, explaining that the mean term of the whole hierarchical series, the rational soul, is itself composed of three terms, the world soul, the anima mundi, the, soul of, the souls of the spheres, the anima sphaerarum, and the souls in each sphere. It only makes sense for Ficino to bring this orderly sequence uh, the, of, of his complete hierarchy to a close by discussing the mean term, the soul of the spheres, of the mean term, the rational soul, in the final chapter of book four. So the whole uh, series of books one through four can be schematized as I have it up on the screen. Having unfolded uh, the complete sequence in, of terms in Platonic Theology book four, Ficino begins a new compositional order in book five, which begins his exposition on the immortality of the soul, which is in fact the subtitle of the Platonic Theology on the immortality of the soul, but he really only gets to it in book five. 
So this analysis re reveals a number of features about the first four books of the Platonic theology. First, it constitutes an autonomous section of the work in which each book and chapter connects to others as parts to parts and as parts to wholes. Second, Ficino arranges these four books as a symmetrical series according to a law of mean terms. Although the rational soul is the mean of the five terms, uh, the book four is unmistakably clear that this third essence is itself composed of three terms. Therefore, the symmetrical center of the complete series isn't the human soul, as is often claimed, even by, Fic by Ficino at times, but the mean term of mean terms, that is, the souls of the spheres. The central nucleus of the Platonic theology's cosmology and metaphysics is therefore found in the two lengthy chapters of Book Four. Still, anthropological and psychological approaches towards Ficino's philosophy and his theory of soul as a copula mundi in the Platonic theology have eclipsed much of this. We still hear very often that Ficino is, this book is, is, presents the human soul as the center of the cosmos. These chapters are rich with intertextual references to ancient and medieval philosophers, theologians, poets, and other works by Ficino. He begins the fourth book by stating that his examination of the rational soul is in the mode of hermetic theologians. Interestingly, Ficino doesn't say that he's going to write um, like Hermes Trismegistus, but as the hermetic theologians. Now this recalls a specific position uh, of, of, by Iamblichus in the prologue of the De Mysteris, where he says that priests, ancient Egyptian priests have long ascribed their works to Hermes, the god not just of eloquence, but of all intermediaries, including language, commerce, messengers, and the theological sciences. And Ficino is explicit elsewhere that much of the Hermetica is pseudepigraphic, but here Ficino's comment signals that in this chapter, he's emulating a Iamblichian science of the gods, uh, which functions according to mean terms, which I think is a strategy that he then will adopt again in the third book of his three books on life in the, in the 1480s. Scholars sometimes date Ficino's turn to Iamblichus um, to the extent that they speak about Iamblichus' influence on Ficino uh, to the mid 1480s and 1490s. And I would agree that Ficino certainly studied Iamblichus intensively at this later period of his life. However, he not only studied and translated Iamblichus' De Secta Pythagorica in the early 1460s, he also studied the De Mysteris while he composed the Platonic Theology, as many of the references to Iamblichus demonstrate. Um, as in his later three books on life, here in the fourth book of the Platonic Theology, Ficino employs a Iamblichian method to bridge Platonic and Hermetic positions. The the fourth book picks up, in fact, where the third book left off. Ficino had concluded book three by defining the rational soul according to the platonic principles of being, life, and intellect. I quote, from all this, we can put together the following definition of the third essence. It is life that of its own nature gives life to bodies. It also knows itself and divine and natural things through discursive reasoning. Ficino opens book four by explaining how earth itself has soul and therefore life. And one sees this in how plants and stones grow out of the earth and mountain ridge, ridges like teeth and hair. Examples that he's going to repeat again in his three books on life later. The same is true with water, Ficino says. It too possesses a vivifying soul. Against the position of some, Ficino doesn't say who, some who might argue uh, that these terrestrial and aquatic lives might be caused directly by the influences of celestial souls, Ficino refers to the opinion of the Platonists that celestial influences or celestial accidents are too far removed from their soul, that is their substance, to be the cause of an earthly or aquatic life. In other terms, such a hypothesis is impossible because it's lacking approximate cause, that is a mean term, and it would short circuit the causal chain of the cosmos. I quote, for even were you to attribute the causes to celestial souls, the general celestial impulses will nevertheless have to be confined within particular earthly souls by way of the universal soul of the earth in order for you to proceed from what is celestial in general to its opposite, what is earthly in particular 
by way of an appropriate intermediary, what is earthly yet general. Ficino's argument is a direct application of the Yamblichian law of mean terms as a principle of procession, as I formulated it before. His line of reasoning in these early pages of book four aims at establishing that rational soul shapes and animates the elements, which in turn defines their qualities in order to reach the analogous conclusion that rational soul shapes and animates celestial bodies, which equivalently define their influences. Plotinus's Aeneas specifically um, on nature contemplation in the one, three, eight, helps him explain this. In describing how all levels of being participate in intellect, Plotinus states that nature too contemplates and that her silent contemplation is a lower stage of demiurgic activity that generates beings with rational principles within her. Plotinus personifies her, I quote, and my act of contemplation makes what it contemplates as geometers draw their figures while they contemplate. But I do not draw, but as I contemplate the lines which bound bodies come to be as if they fell from my contemplation. Ficino remodels this Platinian figure of nature in elaborate words that he would later rework in his commentary on Plotinus' Aeneids. And I'll quote this at length. For what, after all, is human art? It is a sort of nature handling matter from outside. And what is nature? It is art molding matter from within, as though the carpenter were in the wood. But if human art, though it is outside of matter, is nevertheless so well attuned and so close to making the work that it can bring definite works to completion in conformity with definite ideas, how much more will the art of nature be able to achieve this? The art which does not touch the outer surface of matter with hands or other external tools in the way the geometer's soul touches the dust as he traces figures on the ground, but rather as the geometer's mind fashions imaginary matter within. So a geometer can do a demonstration um, with, with axioms, uh, with his mind and, and imagination, not just with tools. For just as a geometer's mind, when it ponders in itself the rational principles of figures, forms the fantasy from within the figure's images, and through this fantasy forms to the fantastic spirit and does so without toil or deliberation, so in nature's art, a certain divine wisdom by way of the intellectual rational principles fills with natural seeds the life-giving and motive force linked to it. And through this force, it forms with utmost ease the matter too from within. Nature, according to Ficino, gives birth to a living mathematized cosmos as materia fantastica. She possesses a great power to pour out geometric figures from her mind, shape the substantial forms of the elements with rational principles from within, just as a geometer can shape figures with axioms, not by drawing lines in the sand, but in his or her fantastic spirit, and give them uh, life and movement in matter. This is how one ought to conceive of the power of elemental souls, being life and intellect. The law of mean terms is not superimposed onto the cosmos externally uh, with instruments like a map, a net, or a Cartesian grid. It unfolds, multiplies, and stretches itself internally in nature wherever there is being life and intellect as something like a fantastic projection of an intellect itself. So here, Ficino employs the Timaean and Yamblichian law of mean terms to construct a cosmology, specifically to explain how the immaterial intelligible realm comes into contact with the material cosmos. It needs intermediary celestial souls. Ficino is very specific shortly thereafter. If the lowest elemental spheres of earth and water have souls, a fortiori, so too will the higher elemental spheres of air and fire. And again, a fortiori, so will the higher eight spheres of the heavens. So in sum, according to Ficino, according to these, this ancient structure of the cosmos, the cosmos has 12 spheres and 12 souls. So Ficino is arguing by analogies. Just as there are terrestrial animals who have their own souls separate from the earthly soul, he says, for they can lift themselves up in from the earth on high, either in flight or by building machines. Uh, but plants and rocks uh, don't have their own souls because they need to remain in contact with the earth to grow. Uh, 
Well, so too must stars have their own souls separate from the souls of the celestial spheres. Moreover, since some terrestrial animals possess reason, again, a fortiori, Ficino is arguing in similar ways, the soul of the earth, earth must be rational, just as Plotinus instructs us with his personification of nature. Thus, since the lowest sphere is rational, a fortiori, so too will the soul of the higher spheres. Ficino thereafter leaps into a curiously fascinating thought experiment. He says, at this point, permit me to exchange a few words with the Pythagoreans. The expression he uses, confabulari, um, means to chat or tell stories, and it's a perspectival shift from the previous part of the treatise. Ficino, I think, is emulating Plato, whom he thinks would invoke Pythagorean voices to launch into mythopoetic explanations about reality. Ficino thinks that these Pythagorean moments mark a change in Plato's register to speak about the very similar Aikos muthos or Aikos logos, as Plato says in the Timaeus. Ficino's long Pythagorean digression in book four of the Platonic theology should be thought of in this manner, I think. He begins by stating the three terms in the Pythagorean aphoretic method, great multitudes, oh, I, don't, I don't think I have that slide, my mistake, um, great multitudes, he says, are united uh, by small numbers, small numbers by small unities, and small unities uh, by the one unity. For this reason, uh, the innumerable legions of souls in the cosmic spheres ought to be reduced um, to 12 leading souls, insofar as the, ancient thinks that, the ancients think that the cosmic body has 12 limbs and many joints. Each soul of each of the 12 celestial spheres has 12 governing souls. Uh, leading a multitude of souls in a cosmic procession, which Ficino, whose imagination was trained on Plato's Phaedrus, would surely have conceived as something like a celestial cavalcade. Why? Why this order? Well, Ficino tells us. Because since the soul of each sphere has been selected from the first group of 12 souls and accommodated to its sphere, it is reasonable that it should have recourse a second time to the number 12 the mark of which number we have in the first and in the last sphere. In the first sphere across the zodiac, we see 12 sidereal animals. In each of these animals shines a principal star, like the animal's heart painted in the sky, in Kylo Picti, he says. The soul of the whole constellation lives life in the heart. This is where the Pythagoreans, accordingly, locate the 12 divine souls. In Aries's heart, we find Pallas. In Taurus's, Venus. In Gemini's, Phoebus, the particular. In Cancer's, Mercury. In Leo's, Jupiter. Um, in Virgo's, Ceres. In Libra's, Vulcan. In Scorpio's, Mars, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also in the last sphere, Earth, there are the 12 lives of men. But you know, thereafter lists the 12 lives of men that he organizes according to, again, mean terms through the multiplications of three terms, uh, ratio, ira, and uh, concupiscence. And he adds, if the number 12 is to be seen at the higher, uh, in the two spheres at either extreme of the cosmos, then it will be observed in the intermediary sphere. So the law of mean terms requires that between the first celestial sphere with the 12 signs of the zodiac and the last sphere of, of earth with the 12 kinds of human life, uh, there should be 12 divine souls. The gods of the zodiac who drive the stars in this interpretation um, uh, are not personifications of the planets, it should be emphasized, but they're actual gods. Ficino's great Pythagorean painting in the sky establishes the existence of a great host of souls, but also intellects and deities. He further applies this Pythagorean principle of uniting and reducing a multiplicity to a prior unity um, to, to unfold this cosmic procession. Since at this stage of his thought experiment, uh, things get a little complex. I'll uh, quote Ficino, but interrupt my reading with some commentary. Ficino says, in order, therefore, let us bring the host of souls living in one, any one sphere back to the 12 principal souls living in that same sphere. And again, let us accept that there are 12 princes in any one of the 12 spheres, for according to the ancients, such is the number of spheres in the cosmos. 
Let us refer the 12 princes back to those 12 general souls of those spheres, and in turn refer those 12 souls of the spheres back to the one soul of matter as itself one. So Ficino then applies a further metaphysical principle that he could have found in Iamblichus or distilled in Proclus's Elements of Theology, which assures that there's an equal number of intellects as souls, so that there's a symmetrical proportion or of mathematical values between the two uh, uh, levels of, of, of reality of intellect and soul, he says. But since soul participates in mind and above an unparticipating nature must be a nature that is complete in itself, so the genus of souls is lifted up to the free unparticipating minds, and these minds finally to the one mind. He then continues um, by proceeding uh, from the many to the one this time, as opposed from the one to the many. He says, this one mind being both one and mind must be raised to the absolute one, which is not uh, one this or one that, one mind or one soul, but the one itself, what Pythagoreans call the universal Apollo, for he interprets Apollo as haplun, meaning simple, or apollon, meaning cut off from the many. He calls it tagathon, the good itself, because the goodness and perfection of each thing consists in its unity, so that if goodness and unity are the same in nature, then above nature, the prime one and the prime good are the same too. Ficino then reviews the whole order, proceeding from the one to the many. Therefore, the prime one and good rules over the one mind next to it. The one mind rules over the many minds, first perchance over the 12 leading minds, perhaps then over the 12 groups of 12 minds under them, and then over the multitude of minds, and finally over a single world soul. The one world soul rules over the 12 souls of the 12 spheres. These 12 souls rule over the 12 twelves of souls. The soul of each sphere, in other words, rules over the 12 most important souls in its sphere. Then these 12 rule over numberless souls, for in each sphere, the 12 princely souls govern the spheres, uh, other souls. So to recapitulate what Ficino has just told us, Below the one is intellect, which subsumes 12 leading minds, um, identified, if you can see my cursor here, which corresponds to this here. Um, below the one is intellect, which subsumes 12 leading minds, which themselves subsume 12 groups of 12 minds who oversee a host of minds. Below this, is the soul, which subsumes another order of 12 souls of 12 spheres, which again subsume 12 groups of 12 souls who oversee a host of souls. The mathematical sequence in uh, book four of Ficino's Platonic Theology can't be missed. He structures both his metaphysics and his cosmos as a procession from the one to the many by means of a multiplication of 12s. These 1,728 minds and 1,728 souls oversee a legion of other minds and souls. Ficino concludes uh, this Pythagorean thought experiment by quoting the Orphic hymn to Apollo to express the harmony of the symmetrical proportions between the intelligible realm and the visible cosmos, between the hypercosmic and the incosmic dodecades of gods. I quote, but this choir of muses sings and dances perpetually as Orpheus says, a musical measure to the command of Apollo himself. I quote Ficino quoting the hymn, it is you who rule and temper the whole heaven with your melodious lyre, but, who, but we have conversed enough with the Pythagoreans. Let's return to the Platonic order as planned. That's where he ends the thought experiment. Once more, the system of sy symmetries and proportions in the Timaeus are key for Ficino's cosmology here that the number of souls must correspond to the number of intellects is necessitated by the decree in the Timaeus that the demiurge made an equal number of an equal number and an equal kind of living beings in the world as there exist in the paradigmatic intellectual forms. The character Timaeus soon thereafter states that the stars are, I quote, living creatures divine and eternal and abide forever revolving uniformly in the same spot. That Ficino has the Timaeus in mind is further confirmed by the fact that the Timaeus, that Timaeus thereafter calls these astral movements and their temporal measurements choric dances, an image that finds an intertextual parallel with Ficino's choir of muses. 
So why does Ficino order this as a symmetrical equation of 12 to the power of three? First, Ficino is interested in the symbolic and religious values of 12s, and he thinks that Plato venerated the, this, the divine with this number in a Pythagorean manner. Second, Ficino is also captivated by the mathematical value of 12. Plato had mathematized the elements as geometrical solids by combining triangles, themselves the simplest plane figures composed of multiple lines. The first solid, the pyramid, being fire, the second, the octahedron, air, the third, the icosah icosahedron, water, and the fourth, the cube, earth. Plato then utters mysteriously that God used a fifth geometric solid, the 12-sided dodecahedron, to paint the cosmos. Behind Ficino's reference to Pythagorean cosmic painting is Plato's reference to this mysterious dodecahedral cosmic painting, which in Ficino's mind should be thought of as the 12 signs of the zodiac, a set of celestial images projected from a prior invisible, mathematized, intelligible reality. That this order of 12 ought to be generated as a power of three is the result of the aforementioned threefold stages of the Pythagorean method. The sum of this metaphysical and cosmic multiplication is the fatal number 1,728, which corresponds to the providential and cosmic time span. Now, Michael Allen, in a book called uh, Nuptial Arithmetic, demonstrated that in the 1490s, Ficino was fixated on solving one of Plato's most infamous mathematical problems, namely the passage in the Republic where Socrates, um, after he wonders if he should invoke the muses for help, uh, Socrates tries to determine what is the value of a per the perfect number, or sometimes called the fatal or nuptial number, that measures divine generation and corruption, the cycles of times, and also how governments fall, according to Ficino. And Ficino would have a lot to say, I think, uh, about the fact that uh, one of the great conjunctions is taking place uh, in a couple of weeks. Understanding this obscure passage was a vixata quaestio among the ancients, and Ficino put forward a mathematical formula, again, based on 12 to the power of three to solve it as a duration of um, 1,728. And it is this number that governs fate and providential time, according to Ficino. I can now conclude that Ficino was already playing with this Pythagorean mathematical formula uh, to explain the mean terms of the soul of the spheres um, in his Platonic theology, in the late 1460s, early 1470s. Ficino's imaginative Pythagorean confabulation or thought experiment is at the heart of this work. Still, Ficino seems to keep this material, which might verge on or at least draw comparisons with polytheistic multiplications of gods below the one God and an ironic arm's length by painting it as a very similar explanatory mathematical model of the cosmos akin to how the character Timaeus describes his own account as a ikos muthos or an ikos logos in the dialogue. For these reasons, it's likely that Ficino closes the chapter by reviewing his mean terms with caution. I quote, we conclude then that there are three levels of rational souls. In the first place is the single world soul. In the second, the 12 souls of the 12 spheres. In the third, the many souls which are contained in the individual spheres, all which pertain to the souls of the spheres and are and here set forth from the point of view of the Platonists will be confirmed only when a council of Christian theologians after careful examination agrees upon them. Despite these reservations, Ficino then continues the program exactly as he planned it out in the next chapter, on the soul of the spheres, by, that is the middle term of the whole sequence, fittingly by interpreting the great myth in Plato's Statesman of the law of fate, the movement of the heavens and their figures and the duration of providential circuits of time. It is at this limit where Ficino's visible cosmos comes into contact with his intelligible world. So to conclude, I've argued today for a symmetry between the compositional and cosmological and metaphysical orders in the first four books of Ficino's Platonic Theology. The central mean term to this hierarchical structure is the soul of the spheres, not the human soul. In book five, Ficino begins to give greater attention to the human soul, and although this change 
does not create an imbalance that capsizes or changes the course of the 18 books of the Platonic theology as a whole. It does shift the perspective of the works philosophical hermeneutics towards the human soul. Thank you.